welcome to Delivering Miracles, a podcast to teach women like you tips and strategies on how you can have a safer pregnancy so you can bring home a healthy baby. I'm your host and your high-risk pregnancy expert, Parijat Deshpande. I can't wait to chat with you. One of the things that I hear most frequently from women who have a high-risk pregnancy is how helpless they feel. Like they just can't control anything that's going on. And that makes sense, right? You've got a lot of things going on that are just, it feels like they're happening to you. And actually, I mean, that's true of pregnancy in general. Let's let's just put aside high-risk pregnancy for a second. Pregnancy in general is a time of really learning how to relinquish control, right? You have so many things that are going on in your body that are so different than how your body typically functions. You've, you know, you're growing and you're stretching and you've got organs that have people in them, right? You've got organs shifting all over inside your body. You've got your, literally your center of balance changes when you're pregnant. You've got, you know, hair changes and skin changes. And we did a whole episode about all the crazy stuff that happens during pregnancy, which I really wish we talked more about so that you didn't feel like a complete lunatic when it's you're the only person that it happens to because it's not just you, but you feel like it's just you, but it's not you, I promise. So pregnancy in general, right, is a time of really just letting go and really learning to accept that things are happening to your body that you don't have a ton of control over. And then you add on to that having pregnancy complications or having you know, some kind of issue with you or the baby and it gets really scary and it really starts to feel like there's nothing you can do. And especially in the case when your baby's life hangs in the balance, that's really disconcerting. I mean, disconcerting doesn't even begin to describe it, right? I, like, I remember feeling that way. I remember when I was on hospital bed rest. That's when really it just got horribly horrible. If you know my story, if you've heard it and kind of been around for a little while, you know that I had a very, very complicated pregnancy. I had so many different complications. By the time I was on hospital bed rest, it was just kind of ludicrous at that point. Like, really? One more? There's really one more? I think actually when I was on hospital bed rest, I ended up gaining three more complications than when I came in with them. So anyway, but all that to say, I understand that sense of helplessness because you go to your doctor's appointment, you feel like you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what news you're going to get. Or you end up in the hospital. You don't know what's going on. It's not like you can see. You don't have a constant ultrasound machine attached to you. And even though they do attach the heart rate monitor, you still don't know what's happening. And that can be really scary and that can make you feel really helpless. But here's the thing about helplessness, right? Is we kind of brush it off like, well, yeah, I feel helpless. There's nothing I can do. And this is what I hear from women all the time. I'm terrified. I'm scared. I'm so anxious. I'm so stressed. But there's nothing I can do. And there's just this assumption, which is really what helplessness is all about, right? Is this assumption that there literally is nothing that you can do. And so, you know, I've been hearing this so much and so much. And as I hear it, it reminds me of a classic psychology study that was done decades ago that is such a cool study and is referenced all the time still, even though it's such an old one. It was done with dogs. And the study is referenced so often because it's so powerful in showing us and helping us understand what's going on and help with when we feel helpless. So the study with dogs, what they did was they they created three different groups of dogs. I don't know what kind of dogs they were. In my head, they were always German shepherds. And now I can't think, is that because I saw a picture of that and that's why it is or... If I just made that up, I don't know. But anyway, I imagine them as German Shepherds. I don't know if they actually were or not. They were dogs. And they split them up into three groups. Group one, well, actually, all three of the the groups were put into these like cages, okay? Group one, 
the cage ha- administered these really light shocks to their feet. But if they jumped over a barrier to the other side of the cage, they could turn the shocks off. Group two was in the exact same kind of cage, except even if they jumped over the barrier, they still couldn't turn the shocks off. And then group three was a control group, so it had no shocks. None at all. So they ran them through their groups, you know, group one in their box, group two in their box, group three in their box. And then they took all the dogs out and they put them all in the same type of box, which is that all of them, if they jumped over the barrier, could turn their shocks off, right? Before each group had a different setup, one could turn them off, one couldn't turn them off, and one had no shocks. Now, all three of them were in a box that were administering shocks but they all of all of them could turn them off and look what happened groups one and three so group one is the one in the original box was able to turn it off and group three is the one that had no shocks right groups one and three learned really quickly how to turn the shocks off in the second phase of the experiment but group two the ones who could not turn the shocks off in the original box didn't even try when they were in a box where they could turn them off and they waited for the experimenter to turn the shocks off instead. That is profound. That is so huge because what this tells us, what this study and then the dozens upon dozens upon dozens of studies that came after it, What that tells us about helplessness is that it's learned. It's a learned behavior, which is really good news for you because it means you can turn it around. And here's why that's important. Because helplessness, feeling like you have no control, feeling like there's nothing you can do to influence the outcome or influence, in this case, your health, your pregnancy, how your baby is. Feeling that way, that helplessness is a huge, huge risk factor for depression. And while that on its own deserves enough attention... That's not all because depression during pregnancy is a risk factor for so many complications for you and your baby, including gestational diabetes, preterm labor, preterm delivery, and low birth weight for the baby. This is really serious stuff. Turning around your helplessness is not just about you feeling better. It is really about improving the health of your pregnancy. So if you are pregnant, you've got to turn this around and unlearn that helplessness so you can get back in control of your high-risk pregnancy and stay pregnant as long as possible. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I've been there, right? I've been there going to every appointment, wondering when that other shoe is going to drop, waiting for some more bad news. And then when it came, being like, see, I knew it would, right? Really believing that you can have some control. I, I was there even through my fertility journey, And trying to even get pregnant. Well, my body's just doing crazy things. You know, I joke with my doctor all the time about, yeah, well, you know, you've, you don't have to live with this body. I've got this body that just does whatever it feels like. And I've just got to catch, uh, catch up and kind of keep up with whatever's going on. I mean, it was a joke, but I understand it. I do understand. At the same time, I do also know the importance of turning it around. And that's why I do the work that I do is to help women get that control back because that helplessness is a really big issue. It, it's, it's like a little pebble in a lake or the ocean. You can throw it in there and it seems like it does hardly anything, but if you actually watch the ripples, they go pretty darn far. And when you're pregnant, you don't want to mess around with that. Because it's not just your health that's being affected by it, right? 
A while back, I had a client who I'll call Samantha. She came to me because she was referred by her OB. Her OB was telling her like, hey, you've got to get your anxiety under control. You're really anxious. And when I met her for the first time over our virtual sessions, I saw what the doctor meant. The, her OB had actually sent me a, speci- a separate note saying, hey, FYI, I sent you this, I refer this patient over to you and told me a little bit about her. And in the note said something like, she's really, really anxious with like italics and underline. I thought, okay, uh, I, I see what you mean here. And when I met her, I thought, okay, yes, I really, really see what you mean. Um, she was really anxious. She was terrified about everything everything she was on bed rest or I think it was modified bed rest because she was able to get up and walk around so modified like light couch potato rest I think but she was at home for the most part and I remember seeing her on the screen she had this super curly hair she was in her pajamas because we had a morning session and she had these big glasses that uh, kept sliding down her nose. I find that so cute <laughs> sometimes. Uh, it happens to um, a relative of mine too. It's just the way the nose is shaped, it just kind of slips down a little. But she was anxious. I mean, man, was she anxious. She just, she, and I, I'm not even exaggerating when I say she was terrified of everything. She just, every, everything worried her, everything. You know, should I eat this? Should I sit like this? Should I stand up? Should I not stand up? What's going to happen? She was going, the reason the doctor actually referred her is because she was going to the doctor every single week, two to three times a week. And she'd just show up and say, I want an appointment. And of course, they're not going to deny her an appointment. And at some point after, I think like three or so weeks of this, when the ultrasound showed up fine, when the blood work showed up fine, the exam showed up fine, that's when her doctor said, you know what, we need to, we need to address this because you're, this is, you're in it for the long haul. And I don't want you to be this anxious for the rest of your pregnancy. It's not going to be fun for you and it's not good for you. So we dug a little bit to figure out, you know, where is this anxiety coming from? And immediately, I didn't have to dig very far because immediately she just told me there's nothing I can do in my pregnancy. There's nothing I can do for my baby. I hate that. And she would say this over and over and over and over until I literally banned her from saying it. I said, you cannot say this anymore. As long as you are talking to me, you cannot say this. I don't want to hear that phrase. I, there's nothing I can do anymore from you. And it was hard for her to turn that off, right? Because she was so used to saying it. It just flew off of her tongue. It's, you know, like when people have those, uh, habits of saying um or uh or like or something and you don't even realize you're doing it until you hear yourself talking or somebody points it out to you it's be- it's just such a habit it's so natural you just don't even know i have a friend who pointed out recently that she and i say exactly all the time when we're talking to each other I had no idea until I (laughs) paid attention after she said something and we were talking the other day and she was saying something about, she's getting married recent, uh, soon. I was talking something about her wedding and planning it and I was like, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I had to stop and go, oh my gosh, I do say that all the time. But I had no idea and same thing with, with Samantha. She had no idea. So I had to stop her from saying it. And you know what happened? When she stopped saying it, I remember there was a day when she when she and I were talking and she said, I feel more energy all of a sudden. And really at this point, there wasn't a whole lot that we had done other than getting her to stop saying there's nothing I can do. It was quite early in our work together. But she never really realized the power of her words. And when I pointed that out, it became very clear to her. And that's what I want to share with you is 
what you're saying, what you're thinking is having a very physical effect on your body. And it can be as simple as how energized you feel. I mean, think about when you go to have coffee with a friend who you like and, you know, you've been friends for a while, but this friend is super negative, right? It feels draining to be around somebody like that. It feels like they suck the energy out of you. You know who I'm talking about, right? Like we've all got a friend like this where you know, you see them calling and you go, oh, I'm having a really good day. I kind of don't want to go down that rabbit hole or oh, I don't really have time to have that kind of conversation. You know, like those friends, we've, we've all got one. That feeling, that friend of yours, that's in your head 24-7 when you are feeling helpless. When you're saying things to yourself like there's nothing I can do, I can't. I just have to wait and see, I can't do anything, my hands are tied, I'm just going to have to wait and figure out what happens, things will just get better on their own. That's what's happening in your body. And physical energy is just one impact, right? It's just one ripple of that little pebble of helplessness that you've thrown in the ocean, Feeling helpless also impacts the decisions that you make. You know, Samantha had to switch up her diet a little bit because she developed really borderline gestational diabetes, but enough that her doctor was like, yeah, we should just make some tweaks to your nutrition and your exercise regimen. But because she felt like she had no control over anything, she unconsciously sabotaged her diet. She didn't do it on purpose. She was super meticulous about tracking everything. But, you know, she'd slip in an extra few pieces of fruit or she'd, you know, take an extra bite of a piece of chocolate one day or she'd choose to walk, but then she'd stop just a quarter mile short of how far she really needed to go because she'd tell herself it didn't matter. It was like what she was doing was checking boxes, but in the back of her head when she was doing anything was, there's nothing I can do. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm just doing it because my doctor told me, but I don't think this matters. And when you think that way, and hey, look, we all do this, okay? This is not just her. If this sounds like you, it's not just you. We all do this when we have those moments of feeling helpless. But I want you to understand that this helplessness bleeds into your entire life. And unconsciously or consciously, you are living your life to perpetuate this belief that there's nothing you can do. And so it gets just turns into this like mix up huge feedback loop that just feeds on each on itself. And by the time you're so far in it, you can't see how different it can be. But that's why I'm here today to tell you that if you're pregnant, you have to turn this around. And you can because helplessness is learned and you can unlearn this helplessness to get back in control of your high-risk pregnancy so you can actually influence how long you stay pregnant it is absolutely possible now i know what you're thinking how how is this even possible to unlearn this helplessness when i'm going through something that's actually out of my control i'm not doing anything to cause my complications and you're right you're not you're not doing anything to cause your complications you're not doing anything to make this happen this is not your fault but it is your responsibility to turn it around and I'm gonna give you three tips right now that you can implement immediately to start ridding yourself of the helplessness well actually I'll give you four number one is to stop saying the words that there's nothing I can do (laughs) okay that one comes courtesy of uh, my client Samantha and our work together okay so In all seriousness, though, the first one is to watch your thoughts and watch your speech. Okay? Do you find yourself believing that you're unlucky? 
all this, I'm just so unlucky. All this stuff just keeps happening to me. Do you find yourself thinking or saying that bad things always happen to you, but good things happen to other people? Do you believe that when you get good news from your blood test, your ultrasound, from your doctor, that it was just pure luck, but bad news is really the truth? Does that sound like you? Because any one of those things is feeding your helplessness. It's all feeding right into it. And so you've got to turn those thoughts around. You've got to challenge them. You've got to turn them around. You've got to get yourself to stop thinking and saying these things. And you know what? I mean, I'm, I'm laughing a little bit about this, but the exercise that I gave Samantha to do of just stop saying it really does work, especially for a habit that's super, super ingrained. That's a great way to just interrupt that pattern and say something else or do something else. You can do or say anything else, but just get yourself out of the habit of saying or thinking these things. It makes a tremendous difference and you've got to start somewhere. And this is one of the easiest places to start. Okay. So that's number one. Watch your thoughts and your talk. Okay. Number two is to take conscious control over your life. And that means really making conscious choices every single day. Can you choose whether you have a complication or not? No, right? And does does choosing what you wear today impact your blood pressure in the morning? No. But the fact that you can choose your clothes is your choice. What you eat is your choice, even if you are on a special diet during your pregnancy, Even going so far as to say, I'm choosing to, I'm choosing to stay in my pajamas today. I'm choosing to sleep in today. I'm choosing to eat cereal in the morning. Say it out loud so it's real. Remind yourself that you do have choices every single day. They may not be huge choices. I know if you could really choose anything, you'd take your complication away. You'd make sure your baby was safe. But you have to understand, remember the ripple analogy. This pebble is causing ripples for miles. And that means that when you take that pebble away, you are actually helping your pregnancy. I know it might seem hard to believe, but there is such a strong connection between how you feel emotionally and what's happening in your body physically during your pregnancy and helplessness because it's so common. We think it happens to everyone. Okay, it's not a big deal. It's so not true. It is a really big deal. And so turning it around with even these little tiny acts of making conscious choices really can add up. And you might even notice what Samantha noticed, which Maybe after doing this for about a week, you'll recognize, gosh, I feel like I have more energy all of a sudden. Or you'll notice maybe your mood lift a little bit more. Or you'll notice that you're smiling a little bit more. Or there's an achiness in your shoulder or your back that's gone. You will see this happen. And the more you do it and the more you turn this around, it's going to positively impact the complications you're facing too. It will. I see it happen every day and it'll happen for you too. So number one, watch your thoughts or your talk. Number two is to take conscious control over your life. And number three is to set goals for yourself. I know when I was going through my pregnancy, setting goals felt scary because I didn't know if I would ever make it. So I never set a goal for making it to a certain time or a certain part in my pregnancy because I didn't know that there was any way I would make it there. I think towards the end of my pregnancy, actually, let me take that back. Towards the end of my pregnancy, at the time I didn't know it was towards my towards the end, but it ended up being towards the end. I thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to make it to 28 weeks. It's going to happen. And then I, well, and then my water broke at 23 weeks and I calculated how far that was from 28 and I was like, oh my God, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> so I understand. What I'm trying to say is I understand if setting goals for your pregnancy seems scary. I've been there. I get it. 
But these don't these goals don't have to be serious or they don't even have to be related to your pregnancy at all. Right? They can be things like how far do you want to get in your book today? or the number of phone calls you want to return, or how many times are you going to allow yourself to Google in one day? Like set something, give yourself some goals to work towards. Pick it and then stick with it. Because when you have something to work towards like that, you start taking action. And the best antidote for helplessness, where you feel like you can't do anything, or that nothing you do matters, The best antidote for that is to actually do something. And I know that for a lot of moms who I work with and who I talk to, they go, but yeah, that's not going to fix the problem. No, it's not directly fixing the problem, but it is indirectly fixing it. It's like when you break your arm, the cast is there to keep your arm together so that your bones can fuse back together right? The cast isn't doing that for you. It's indirectly helping you fix your broken arm. The cast isn't actually doing it. It's just helping. That's the same thing here. It's not directly fixing your complications, but it is going to impact your pregnancy. It will do it because that mind-body connection is so, so important and it is so strong. So if you're pregnant You've got to turn this around and unlearn that helplessness so you can get back in control of your high-risk pregnancy and help yourself stay pregnant as long as possible. So a quick recap, watch your thoughts and talk, take conscious control of your life and set goals for yourself every single day, no matter how big or small. I found the most appropriate quote for today by Louise Hay. And she says, you have the power to heal your life and you need to know that. We think so often that we are helpless, but we're not. We always have the power of our minds. Claim and consciously use your power. How amazing is that and how true is it for going through a high-risk pregnancy? I know if you had a magic wand, you would want all of this to go away. And if I had that magic wand for you, I would give it to you in a heartbeat. But since we don't have that, you've got to remember that this helplessness is a learned behavior, which means you can unlearn it. And unlearning it means You can influence the health of your pregnancy and you can influence how long you stay pregnant. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And look, if you're sick of it, if you are super tired of feeling helpless and feeling out of control and you want to know how to get back in control in a way that changes the course of your pregnancy to help you stay pregnant as long as possible, I would love for you to schedule a complimentary consultation. Visit my website at barijatdeshpande.com to do that. Also, I would love to stay in touch, so follow me on Twitter or Instagram, or Facebook. The handles for all three are Parijat Desh. That's P-A-R-I-J-A-T-D-E-S-H. You have more control than you realize. And that control can impact how long you stay pregnant. Your time is right here, right now to decide. Are you going to wait and let outside forces decide how your pregnancy goes? Or are you going to take the reins and have a say? The choice is yours. Take it one day, one step at a time. You can.